basically retro games, a modern approach. So this is going to present the old games, especially Brazilian games, for devices from the 80s and the 90s that are really winning the heart of many collectors here. And this panel is originally in Portuguese, but if you want to listen to it in English, you just need to use the link that you see in the chat. So let me invite our participants, Renato De Giovanni, editor and producer of content in Tilt Online, Felipe Vega, and Marcus Vinicius Garay from Benem's Software. So how are you doing, guys? Are you well? Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I think one of you is muted. Is it, uh, is it me? All right, all right. I love your tie, your bow tie. Ain't it fancy? Mm -hmm. I'm going to dress up tomorrow as well so that I can match his look. Ah, jokes aside, the floor, or rather the screen, is yours. All right, so hello, everyone. Whether you're watching it online or you're going to be watching this later, we have the Tilt Bitnamic group here with you. And if you don't know us, I'm going to just clarify a point that's very important. On the 19th of July, 2020, we had a national launch. It was an online launch because it was already in the middle of the pandemic. And we launched it in the Jobs to Jogos website. And it was a game that was developed in the Brazilian market in 1983. as an adventure in text game. And this game experienced all of the device revolution that we had with all of the machines that we had with new consoles. And in July, 2020, I am here, I was here with Marcus and Felipe in July, 2020, and we relaunched this game in Brazil on that a uh, live streaming session that was sponsored by the Lives de Jogos game, Lives de Jogos website. And in 20 minutes, everything was sold out. Even the 10 extra units that I had set out to uh, give as gifts to friends, they were also uh, sold. What's special about that? Well, there are two things. First, it was quite pricey. The treasure chest, the most expensive, uh, expensive one, was at 380 reals. Another important thing is that this game was launched in 2020, rather relaunched. And the original media that it was launched in this past 30 years and for the consoles and machines that are no longer available in the market consoles and machines that are only available um, if you're a collector, basically. So this was a niche within a niche within a niche. And it was really amazing that we had that many consumers. And it was an absolute hit. We have had a few hits with this kind of approach in the past uh, months. And this is what we're going to be talking about here. So Marcus and Felipe, I'd like you to talk specifically about this fantastic day, which was the 19th of July, 2020. So Marcus. Hey everyone. It's interesting, isn't it? These are consoles and devices that were successful in the 80s. These were games and names that were familiar to those who played games. And a lot of people are still interested in them. 
people who want to have that cassette, that cartridge, and they want to have that at home. So as uh, Renato Giovanni uh, is a great developer, and it's fantastic that we preserve and that we pay homage to these people. Otherwise, these stories, these games could have been lost. Well, it's been many years after all, hasn't it? And as Renato said, it was fantastic, it was incredible. We relaunched Amazonia and Aventuras na Selva, so Adventures in the Jungle. These are games that were produced in Brazil. And Felipe? Well, I'd like to send my regards to Marcos and Renato. It's a, an honor to be here talking to the big festival audience. I'd just like to uh, make a brief introduction here. I am a partner of Bitnamic Software alongside Marcus. And we publish and relaunch Plaza Games. And I'm the co-editor of a magazine with Marcus as well. And we've been working on preserving the 80s software. And in that context, bit Dynamic, Bitnamic was created from a number of conversations that Marcus and I had. We were working together for this magazine called Spectrum. And there was a cassette that was going to be sold with the magazine in an edition. And demos in the 80s were available um, with cassettes, or on cassettes, rather. And Marcus continues to write about these um, antiques, right? These older games and developers. And that sparked the idea to relaunch Amazonia. We're already very fond of the idea of having a publisher. And we ended up launching En Busca dos Tesoros, right? So searching for treasures in a literal translation. And Mark is going to be talking about that in a moment. So we were relaunching uh, Classic Games. Right, Marcus? Yep, absolutely. That's the idea. Some of these games back in the day, they were not launched with a lot of of fancy, so to speak. They weren't given a lot of attention. So it is, in a way, a late acknowledgement of the talent of these developers who were able to produce something at a time when information was a privilege. These machines, consoles, they came from abroad. They were cloned, so to speak. and. Uh, knowledge was at a premium back then. So you would only have access to information sometimes months later than it was first made available. So Renato Giovanni and others, they were real heroes. And that's why we created Bitnamic. And we are being very successful in relaunching these classic games. Not sure if you noticed, but uh, Felipe is Portuguese from Portugal. I like to say that he's our um, outreach in Europe. Uh, he's in contact with the folks from Portugal, Spain, uh, the UK. It's, it's close. Uh, so what's happening all over the world, it's an interesting uh, movement of, of recovery, of seeking out games from the 80s and 90s, uh, games that were lost in time, as Marcus mentioned. Some were not uh, duly recognized, others were launched, but never reached a, uh, a high uh, level in terms of sales. And so 
the, we're recovering all that information, which is extremely important. Uh, we, we, can't, we can't simply lose that. It's not just a cultural uh, matter, both from Brazil, Portugal, Spain, and the UK. Some countries are a bit further down the road than we are, and uh, we're going now into a phase where we exchange back and forth with Portugal. But curiously, uh, back in the 80s, uh, something we didn't have. So all games launched in Portugal uh, back in the day, we didn't, we don't know in Brazil. And all the games that were launched in Brazil during that period, they didn't get to know. Rediscovering something that even further consolidates the the interest uh, for new discoveries and and recovery, which is wonderful work that the folks from Portugal are doing of recovering the physical media, 30, 35 years old. Uh, some are more or less deteriorated, but with great care and willingness and desire to, you know, recover that material, focusing on advertising and publishing and, and making it known what was gaming production in the 80s and 90s. You know, I've been fighting for this a long time in the market, uh, in the industry. We need this kind of work of production, even as a historical record of what happened, to take lessons away from that, even though the industry is very different today than what it was in the 80s and 90s, commercially speaking. But there are lessons back there that are uh, uh, still suitable for today. Uh, we don't have to, you know, come on, reinvent the wheel, go through the same problems again that they had to go through back then. because that information has to be recovered and, and kept safe. Marcus has an extremely important role there. He writes a lot about this in books. And, and Felipe in Portugal is our attache for the other side of the planet. <laughs> right on, Felipe. In Portugal, let's say up until recently we thought that the gaming industry in portugal had started in the 21st century come on that's not true in the 80s in portugal there were a decade of great social transformation we we had just uh, ceased to be a dictatorship we joined the eu and the computers became uh, everyday use for portuguese uh, folks from my generation remember the Spectrum uh, PC. It, it was then became commonplace. And there were Portuguese computer factories, uh, software production. But because of lack of laws, it was generalized piracy. And so uh, there was no protection for game production in Portugal. Most uh, homebrew productions, homegrown, they were kept in magnetic uh, records, and all the cassette tapes were forgotten uh, uh, when the 90s came with the consoles and PCs uh, industry booming. And the gaming industry, for many people in Portugal, started in 2003 in the 21st century. You know, uh, then there was retro computing and emulation and uh, the collectors I've mentioned, Planet Sinclair by my friend André Leon. We started putting together this puzzle of Portuguese games. One of our friends, João Ramos, created a Portuguese technology related to this spectrum uh, that was in his hometown and in Spain, in the UK. There's a great dynamics around these projects. They cooperate amongst themselves. Our, uh, our team also cooperates with them. 
And so we try to recover older games. We look for games to restore every week. And this is extremely important for the historical record, not just for the tech community, but for the game developing community as well. It's important to highlight. We work with two terms in in recovering things. It's remake and remastering. Remaking is getting a game and rebuild it, you know, from, from, of course, keeping certain elements from the original game. But usually the remake, you're remaking the whole game. We, we love remastering, which is getting a game. It's almost if you polished, you know, you bring it into more modern equipment to run in modern machines, but still it's that very game from the 80s, from the 90s with that uh, mechanics, uh, gameplay. We, we work on image and sound a bit, of course, bearing in mind in the 80s, games rarely had sound because equipment had no sound. So the games had minor noises, you know. Today we have soundtrack a bit, you know. We, we, we run some improvement on the sound side and, and the images in treating, giving it a bit of a, mo a bit more modern treatment, but uh, still keeping the, the identity, not just a visual identity, but mechanics, uh, look and feel, you know, every, everything that really blew us away when we were kids, you know, when we were uh, adolescents, it still blows us away because people look at that today. Oh, I played this so often. I played this so much. I, I went uh, nights on end, you know, with these games and I'll be able to play them again. This is so cool. Um, it really uh, provides uh, feedback, not just in terms of sales, but, uh, you know, it's a way we're recovering uh, key moments in people's lives. And so that's probably why the retro movement is, uh, you know, so many people are, are buying into. <laughs> Come on, Marcos, you can talk more about the launch of Amazonia, what it was like, the Mimos story. Uh, just wanted to add, we lived through the arrival of microinformatics in Brazil, IT. It's a key era in Brazil of, you know, people being blown away by the novelty of a computer, of a PC. So it was a fantastic moment. And indeed, we relaunched uh, Amazon with all the ceremony. There was the standard product, uh, cool. Big box illustrated, uh, the fully illustrated with maps and and there was a uh, incredible version, the treasure chest, uh, especially uh, a special version, a premium version with a came into in a case with a replica of a uh, compass. Uh, it's vital. Uh, it's a crystal in a little bag, other important element in the game in Amazonia. We re-edited uh, Microsystems. Microsystems was the first uh, IT uh, magazine way back in the early 80s. We republished uh, uh, number 23 um, edition where they published in 1983. So we created microsystemas from scratch, all the visuals just a bit modernized uh, uh, as uh, with uh, Renato Di Giovanni as the editor of the magazine, fantastic. There was also a replica of the Adventures in the Jungle manual, um, the booklet that was not published at the time. The Adventures in the Jungle would be uh, published in a cassette in newsstands. And so Renato has still this single booklet. We uh, even, uh, you know, printed it in this very same way, you know, a number of things with uh, cassette tapes as 
uh, in, in diskettes and CD-ROMs. It was crazy, indeed. Because uh, this game actually started uh, called as Adventures in the Jungle was designed to be sold in newsstands. There was a, a, a model of the booklet and the cassette tape. Actually, it was not launched that way. It was fully published uh, in the magazine. And in talking to Marcus, we decided to uh, launch the project of, of launching the game as it was done in 82. It was launched in 83. But uh, folks, want to go to the questions, man. <laughs> I see there are some interesting ones popping up here. Here we go. Wow, wow. <laughs> Yes, we already have a few questions for you guys. So for those who are going through a games college, is it worth studying these platforms? Where do we start with? That's a complex question. Uh, so we're not talking about an industry or of millions and millions of copies sold. It's not an easy market. It requires um, great knowledge of that period of time uh, to be able to understand what may work, what might work, what might go wrong. But it's always an option. Um, it's good to revisit uh, games from the 80s and 90s, so even as a way, if you're studying, you know, please don't miss out, uh, you know, at least, you know, quick visit to those games to understand what the game production process was like back then. You know, what's similar, what's different uh, from today. I wouldn't say it's an option for those who have no contact at all with a retro world. The retro world is a world of folks who are <laughs> somewhat you know experienced in life you know we're rescuing uh, 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 the childhood the infancy of these people so you so you need some experience you know uh, at least something from from those days I, I don't think it's is it, oh I'm gonna dedicate myself exclusively to uh, uh, format or build retro games I don't think that's the way but maybe Marcus and Felipe have a different view I may add that currently you don't have to study the old platforms. There are virtual consoles like Apico Oito that reproduce that whole retro environment without needing to uh, have the old platforms. And even for the old platforms, there are several tools to create games. Game Boy games, Mega Drive console. You don't need to go uh, head first, you know, uh, just all in with these platforms. And let's bear in mind, we're talking about machines that have 16 kbytes. kbytes. So, so to, to, to code in 48 kbytes in, in, in 64 Man, that was luxury. That, that was kind of complicated, you know, to code. We worked with pixel art, not because it was good looking. No, it's because computers had no more resolution than that. They couldn't handle anything more than that. So we didn't even have a compiler. Come on. Uh, that's what I was going to maybe mention, Renato. It would be interesting maybe to study how lean those machines were. Uh, depending on the computer line, you had eight colors, 16 colors. Uh, so few uh, sound channels, maybe three for sound and one for noise. So very little memory, 16 K bytes, like uh, Renato Mitch, 64 K bytes, and so kilobytes. And so you open a uh, an empty file on the notepad has more memory than the whole computer at the time. It would be interesting to, to study, maybe. Yes, what's interesting is that today there are many people who create new games. In the case of the platform, ZX Spectrum, Brazil was known as TK, the TK one. Last 
year, 250 games were created for that platform. And we launched one ourselves, Laser Birds, a shooting game, a shooter game, completely new game for that platform. So whether it's remake or remaster or creating new games, there's a large uh, developer community and coder community. Uh, Felipe remembered, well, in January this year in Portugal, there was like a, something like a big festival, just games that were developed in the last few years for uh, computers that are compatible compatible with the uh, ZX Spectrum. Uh, it's been uh, out of the market since 1989, so 30 years that uh, we don't have that machine anymore, despite having been launched. Uh, it's compatible uh, uh, with those running basically the same software, but it's important to produce games for those machines, but producing in that style, in that mechanics uh, gameplay. <laughs> I, I apologize, Renato, Felipe, and Marcus, but your time is just about over. This is so interesting to talk about, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, being a place to keep those retro games, you know, uh, it, it's a library for all this gameplay. It's, it's Im important, interesting for us to talk about, but unfortunately, we're running out of time. I really want to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, for you being here today. No, thank you. Yeah, we appreciate it. Thank you so much. Big Festival 2021, the biggest games festival in Latin America.